Several years ago, our department began a tradition of inviting a graduate of UCLA who has gone on to distinguish him or herself in his or her career to deliver an address to the next generation of UCLA alumni. Today, we're fortunate to have Mr. Stephen Gursky as our keynote speaker. Mr. Gursky is a president of Centerbridge Industrial Partners, LLC. He served as advisor to the president at General Motors until November 2006. Previously, he was a managing director of Morgan Stanley and the senior analyst of the Morgan Stanley Global Automotive and Auto Parts Research Team. He has 15 years of automotive and tire industry research to his credit. Prior to joining Morgan Stanley, he was managing director of Payne Weber's Automotive Group. He worked as an assistant to the senior analyst at Payne Weber and as an analyst on the overseas financial staff of General Motors Corporation before returning to Payne Weber, where he has been, where he has made senior auto analyst. Mr. Gursky has been ranked the number one automotive and auto parts analyst by Institutional Investors All-American Research Team annual investor poll for 12 consecutive years. He holds a BS degree in mathematics, system science from UCLA, and an MBA from Harvard Business School. Please welcome Steve Gursky. Thanks, Gary. Good evening, everybody. I'm honored to be invited to speak at your commencement ceremony and would like to start by congratulating the graduates as well as their family and friends. When I was asked to speak at graduation, it was suggested that I limited my remarks to 10 to 15 minutes. When I mentioned that I had forgotten who had spoke at my graduation, they remarked all the more reason to keep it to 10 to 15 minutes. I have to admit, I had no idea what I would talk about today. So being a former equity research analyst on Wall Street, I decided to do a little research. Humanity.org suggested that the commencement ceremony affirms each student's search for knowledge. It often includes a graduation speech which seeks to put their recent hard work into the context of their future. Words traditionally reserved for momentous occasions may ring true and inspirational at any hour. My sister, who has a son just finishing his freshman year at a college in the East, suggested that she didn't know what the graduates would want to hear, but she thought their parents would want to hear that their tuition money was well spent and that there was a guarantee of employment post-graduation. <laughs> someone else, actually someone younger, suggested graduates would want to hear about money. Actually, they wanted to say more than money, sex also, but mostly money. <laughs> if any of these statements resonate with you, then I'm likely to disappoint, because I'm not going to talk about any of these. What I thought I'd do is spend a few minutes or so on my background and my life after graduation. Here you can get an idea of what one person did with a UCLA education. Then I'll spend some time on things I learned along the way, things I wish I would have known as I went through life after UCLA. Finally, if I do have time, I'll speak to inspirational, momentous occasions, whether tuition money was well spent, guaranteed employment, money, and sex. Let me start at the beginning. I graduated UCLA in 1984 and a quarter. It says 85, but it was really 84 and a quarter. I was on a four and a quarter year plan back then. Uh, I was always interested in the financial markets, so I pursued a career on Wall Street as a research assistant to the equity analyst covering the auto sector at Payne Weber, which is now called UBS. In case you don't know what an analyst does, we basically researched the car industry and tried to decide if GM, Ford, Chrysler, and a bunch of other companies were good investments or not. I worked there for two and a half years and then went to business school. My summer between business school, I worked on the finance staff of General Motors. Coming out of business school, I had a choice of being the third insurance analyst at Lehman Brothers, covering the natural gas industry at First Boston, or going back to GM. And I was actually going to go back to GM, because in corporate finance, the more screwed up a company is, the more fun you're having. And back then, in the late 90s, we were having a lot of fun on the finance staff of General Motors. Uh, you're not taping this, are you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> 
when the auto analyst at Payne Weber came along and said she was going to retire and did I want to take her place, I took that job. About eight years later, I went to Morgan Stanley to run their global automotive research effort. The idea was the car business was going global, the securities business was going global, and I needed to be at a global firm. After spending 10 years at Morgan Stanley, I felt the analyst business was changing. I had accomplished as much as I was going to accomplish, and I wanted to do something else. The opportunity came up to go to General Motors for a period of time and work with the CEO to help the company get through some difficult times. It was a great experience. Basically, after studying a company from the outside for 20 years, to be able to go inside and ask any question you want, get any piece of information you want, was fascinating to me. I've been working at Centerbridge Partners, a private equity firm, for about six months now. Just because you leave UCLA doesn't mean you stop learning. In fact, to prepare for this presentation, I made a list of some of the things I learned post-UCLA. I thought I'd share that, some of that list with you, and maybe it will help you embark on your life after UCLA. I kept the list to seven things because I know people want me to save time for the inspiration, the tuition money being well spent, guaranteed employment, money, and sex. First, uh, if, life, if life is a race, then it is a marathon, not a sprint. When I came out of business school, the woman who I was replacing said she would leave within a year. It took her almost two years to leave. In the meantime, I was bearing more and more of the responsibility while she continued to get the credit. I could have gotten upset, I could have tried to accelerate a departure or left on my own, but I stayed. I liked the job, I was learning a lot, and she and the company treated me well. That clearly outweighed any near-term benefit from leaving for something else. The fact that we were in a bear market back then and there weren't many other things to do also played a role, but in hindsight, I'm glad I stayed. Second, you can go from hero to goat very quickly in the business world. The first stock I ever recommended was a company called the Allen Group. It went from $9 to $20 a share, and I was ecstatic. I did solid analysis, and just about everything I thought would happen was happening. High fives all around. Within six months, the stock was 10 bucks. I didn't know what hit me. I couldn't show my face around the office. It then went up to 30, and I was a hero again, and then went back to 20, at which point I couldn't take it anymore, and I mo removed my recommendation. The point is, don't get too euphoric when things go well, and don't get too down when things don't go well, because there'll be periods of both. Third, it's not about the money. Building wealth is something that many of us aspire to do, but I'll trade a good work environment for money any day of the week. Coming out of business school, I had a chance to go to some very prestigious firms. I chose one that was less prestigious and actually turned down more money to start. I knew the people there, they treated me well, and it was fun to work there. I can't tell you how many people I've met uh, who have taken on high-paying jobs at hedge funds in New York where the lead partner tends to get a little emotional and lose their cool. Someone described it to me like this. They're making more money than they ever imagined, but they go home without their dignity every night. Trust me, no matter how good the money is, it is not a trade-off I would make. The decision to go to General Motors also had trade-offs. The message from the CEO was something like this. It would be great to have Gursky's perspective inside the company, but here's the rub. He needs to be able to deal with a GM-type compensation, which, by the way, was very different than Wall Street's compensation. I agreed to take a substantial pay cut. Why? Because I was curious as to what it would be like. I wanted to help, and I thought the experience of navigating a large corporation could help me somewhere down the line. You want to talk about financial fiasco? When I went to General Motors, the stock price was $36. Within six months, the company experienced the economic effects of two hurricanes, $3 gasoline, decline in the very profitable of SUVs, its largest supplier went bankrupt, it had trouble selling its credit subsidiary, and a corporate activist started to get aggressive. Basically, almost every week something else would go wrong. The company lost $10 billion in 2005, and the stock went to 18. I sat there when I went to GM, and I said, well, most of my compensation's in stock and options, so I thought if the stock went up, maybe it won't be a complete financial fiasco. Then I start watching the stock go down. I think, well, maybe this will just be an expensive education. It goes down even more, and I figure, well, I'll just treat this like a sabbatical. And it falls even further, and I figure, well, maybe the movie rights will be worth something. <laughs> um, number four, understand how much information analysis you want to have before making a decision versus how much information you need to have. There are lots of decisions that are made in life and in business. When making decision, 
good information and good analysis is important. It is unlikely you will get as much information as you want. The question is how much information you need to make that decision. I experienced this when I was a stock analyst. I would analyze a situation to death and meanwhile the stock would run away from me. Um, information and analysis are important in making good decisions, but at some point there's a law of diminishing returns. I found the longer you, you take to make a decision, the easier people will find to poke holes in it and the momentum around the project starts to slow. Number five, if everyone is running to the left, you should think very hard about going to the right. The stock market is a very emotional place. It's very easy to get caught up in the frenzy. On many occasions, the analysis will tell you one thing and the stock price will be telling you something else. That is where opportunities exist, both in the stock market and in life. Sometimes it takes an iron stomach to capitalize on this. To be successful as a stock analyst, you need to tell people when to buy when everybody else is selling. So they think you're not that smart or sort of an idiot. If you turn out to be wrong, it proves they were right and you weren't that smart. But if you're right, you need to start telling people to sell when everyone else is buying, which leads them to think you're not that smart again. Number six, if I had killed all my enemies, I wouldn't have any friends left today. One of the things I found over the years is that people who work with you on one situation may be competing against you on another. My firm, Centerbridge Partners, was partnered with the Blackstone Group in an unsuccessful bid for Chrysler. While that was going on, there was another situation where we were actually competing with Blackstone uh, on a project. The message is, no matter how tough the competition, treat people with respect because you will never know where you run into them again. The last one is, the more you give, the more you make. Soon after I moved to New York in 1985, I went to a charity event where Ace Greenberg, the chairman of Bear Stearns, spoke. Ace said you should give money to charity because he found that over time, the more you give, the more you make. At that event, he gave about 50 times my salary to this charity. And I said, yeah, easy for you to say. But I did try to give something every year. Uh, and it's a funny thing. It actually worked for me for a while. Now, Ace talked about things in financial terms. But as I got older and started a family, I learned that it works in non-financial terms as well, although it's a little different. The more you give, the more you get. Give time with your family. I take my kids to senior citizen center, schools for underprivileged kids, or spending time on the board of visitors at the UCLA School of Economics here, all has non-financial rewards. But in many cases, just like sitting up here and watching another generation of students graduate, the non-financial rewards are significant. So I'm almost done, and before I step down, I just want to leave you with a few things. Despite everything you might think, you will actually have the opportunity to use a lot of the stuff you learned over the past four or five years. And this is coming from a person who went through four and a quarter years wondering whether any of this stuff would be useful. And Francis, I heard you about scarcity and regression and game theory and diminishing returns, and I used all that stuff, and I never thought I would. I also heard you about Red Bull, and I used all that stuff too, so that doesn't go away either. The education you just received is as good as any other out there. I have seen a ton of resumes over the years. I've interviewed and worked with many people from a number of different schools. The UCLA grads are as bright and motivated as any of them. You should have confidence of, of that when you approach the working world. That said, for the most part, nothing falls in your lap. If you want something, you have to go get it. The world is a competitive place. Globalization and technology is making it even more competitive. No matter how good and how qualified you think you are, there are others competing for what you're after. When I graduated UCLA, I sent out 25 resumes to firms on Wall Street. Those 25 resumes got a whopping three interviews and only one offer. It would have been easy to get down, and I did. 24 rejections were not fun, but when I got an opportunity, however, I tried to make the most of it. So that's my story. Given that I don't remember who spoke at my graduation, I'm pretty sure 20 years from now you will not remember me. But as you go through life, you may experience some of the things I experienced. Big company, little company, profit, not for profit, many of the issues are the same. I hope you got something out of this. I hope you enjoy the rest of the graduation. Best of luck in your future endeavors. Gary, thanks for having me.